Before we once again turn to this tremendous text, let us ask the Lord to bless our time together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we would ask that in these few moments we have together, you would meet with us, you would lift up our hearts and our minds from the things of this world to understand heavenly things, eternal things, things that can truly change our lives and make a difference. Be with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, you might be aware of the fact that Reformed Baptists are known for moving very slowly through books of Scripture when preaching. Not that you've gathered any of that from the years that we spent in Matthew and uh, we're all the way into the fourth chapter of Romans and things like that. We, we tend to try to be rather complete in our analysis of the text of, uh, of Scripture. And sometimes that means we spend a, a fair amount of time on just a few words. In fact, I'm, I'm looking here, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This morning's text is eight words long. Yes, eight words long. I was intending to work through chapter 10, verses 15 through 18. It is the natural continuation, sort of the conclusion of what we had worked on not all that long ago here in chapter 10, so it's still fresh in our minds. I had a whole other sermon prepared for this evening, not even in the book of Hebrews, if you can believe that. But I was constrained to spend our time this morning on a small number of words. Now, I, I don't believe that I am in, in any way uh, abusing the text by looking at this because I'm not claiming that it was the author's intent in these words to open up an entire discussion of a subject other than the perfection and completion of the sacrifice of Christ. He remains very focused upon that like a laser. He is not varying from that, but Sometimes we have just texts of Scripture, passing references. For example, you may be aware of the fact that in Acts chapter 13, verse 48, the Apostle, in narrating the preaching of Paul amongst the, the Jews and the Gentiles, makes just, just passing reference. He says, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believe. Now, it wasn't Luke's intention with that little phrase to, to give us a, a doctoral dissertation on the fact that it is the appointment of God that results in human faith. It, it, just, it just wasn't his intention to do that, but the fact that he could so easily and almost lightly make reference to this, tells us that this was, this was something that was, well, it was understood in the Apostle's mind. It, it was understood, it should be understood, by those who read his words. And so sometimes a, a passing statement can cast a, a great deal of light upon something that's very important for us today. Well, what am I referring to. Well, if you've sort of been keeping track of where we are, you know that we finished that tremendous text in verse 14, the last time that I spoke from this pulpit. And so the next verse, verse 15, says, Now the Holy Spirit is testifying to us, saying... For after saying, and then he goes on to quote once again from Jeremiah chapter 31, the same text that was dealt with rather fully back in chapter 8. So he's, he's bringing a text back in and he's, he's actually dividing it up. He says, for after saying the first part, he then says, verse 17, and he makes application. And we will look at that, Lord willing, this evening. But I want to look at the very beginning of verse 15 today. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. Believe it or not, that's all I'm aiming for today. 
is to understand why it is that the writer would just so easily introduce a text from the Old Testament with with these little words. And I want to look at each word because it's very easy for us. And, and sometimes it's, it's appropriate for us. We're following the argument. We're understanding what the Apostle is saying. He's talking about the perfection of the work of Christ and, and how he brings about perfection those for whom his sacrifice is made. And, and there's, this is central to the issue of what atonement is and what it accomplishes and all of that. But that's why just in passing, when he says this, it casts a light upon what it is that the author, and he uses the plural here, us, the early Christians, believed about the nature of Scripture. And if there is anything that we should have learned from looking at the not-too-distant past in church history, in our own nation, It is that when a church, whether it be a local body, or when a denomination, a group of churches, whether it be a a seminary, oh, the, the number of dead seminaries in our land today. We look back and, and there's this constant realignment and almost always it has to do with one thing. It's not what just recently happened in the, the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America where they, they took out of the book of, of order the, basically the words that would require you to be sexually pure if you're going to be a minister in the denomination so they can ordain practicing homosexuals. That's not that. Believe me, the, the, the PCUSA and, and the United Church of Christ and and uh, the ELCA, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, these denominations didn't just overnight wake up and go, hey, let's ordain homosexuals. Why not? Let's just completely overthrow what Christianity has believed about sexual morals and things like that for, for, for how many centuries? And we're... No, that, that was a, that's the end result of a process of decay. And when you look at it and go back, what was it all about? Where did it start? It started when for the first time they took a step away from believing that God has spoken with authority and clarity in the Bible. They all started there. And it may have been subtle, and the first step may not have been obvious, but it's where it all started. And so we have these words and they cast light upon a situation that whether we know it or not, we face today. Because you all, you don't, you don't just sit here in the pews and then never say anything about your Christian faith during the rest of the week. You have interaction with other believers. And you have interaction with people who claim to be believers, but honestly, once you talk with them and you listen to them and you hear what they believe, you go, that's a false faith. That, that's, not a, that's not a saving faith. This person does not believe that the Bible is really the Word of God, does not believe the Gospel, does not believe in the Incarnation, the Trinity, whatever it might be. And it all comes back to whether God has truly spoken. So notice what we have here. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, and that's the introduction to a quotation from the book of Jeremiah. Now, he could have just simply said, for thus it has been written. That's that's the easy, simple way of doing it. And he had, in fact, elsewhere in the book of Hebrews, the writer had said, "Uh, it's written somewhere. You know, they didn't have chapter and verse divisions and things like that. And and especially if you're reading from a scroll, can you imagine what it was like uh, to try to get to the end of the scroll real fast? I mean, uh, they they must have had... uh, Wrist muscles the size of, uh, well, I was going to mention somebody, but he's fallen into disrepute. A very large weightlifter uh, to be able to get there. And so it's sort of hard to give specific reference. It's real easy for us to do that. So at one point he said, well, it, it says somewhere. But here he says, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. Let's think about this 
concept of the Holy Spirit testifying to us. It's the plural. This is a testimony of the Holy Spirit to all of us. To those of us who name the name of Christ, there is a, there is a, a way in which we can understand Scripture as being a testimony of the Holy Spirit given to us. Now, this is not the first time something like this has been said. For example, in Acts chapter 1, verse 16, looking at some of the, the, the way that the early church introduced the Old Testament, in Acts chapter 1, verse 16, we read, Brethren, the Scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas. Think about that. The Scripture had to be fulfilled. But why does it have to be fulfilled? Because it's divine. Well, why is it divine? Well, the Holy Spirit had foretold about Judas by the mouth of David. And so, the New Testament writers, when they read the Old Covenant Scriptures, they recognize, well, David spoke these words. David wrote these words. They recognize that men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so, yes, David said these words, and yet there is more to it than that because the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. And so the early church sees the Holy Spirit being active, especially in bringing about the written Scriptures which are authoritative. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, this great text, we've gone here many, many times to talk about the relationship between God's sovereignty and man's actions, but note something else. Acts chapter 4, verse 24, And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah, his Christ. And so before quoting from the second psalm, in their prayer, they recognize that the reason that this is relevant for them to quote these things is because these are divine words. Who, by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said. Now, that's an awful high view of Scripture. Once again, the Holy Spirit is speaking, but He is speaking by means of human beings. And so the Holy Spirit speaks. And we see in Acts chapter 5, of course, to lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to God. And likewise, in Acts 5.32, and we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. Well, there's that word, witness. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit. Well, that's the very same terminology we have here in Hebrews chapter 10. The Holy Spirit witnesses, testifies, martyreo. It's where we get the term martyr. But it didn't mean you necessarily had to die. What makes a person a martyr is not so much their death as it is their death for giving testimony, for giving witness. A martyr is first and foremost a witness. And so the Holy Spirit testifies, the Holy Spirit witnesses, and here in Acts 5, we are witnesses of these things, so is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit testifies. That shouldn't surprise us, because what did the Lord Jesus tell us in John chapter 15? When He's describing the coming of the Spirit and the ministry of the Spirit, yes, He's a a parakletos, he's the one who comes alongside, he's an encourager, but he's also a testifier. John fifteen twenty six, 
when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father, what will He do? He will testify about Me. And you will testify also because you have been with Me from the beginning. The Spirit will testify about Jesus. Elsewhere it says He'll take of My things. Now, He also convicts the world of sin. The Spirit does many things, but the Spirit is a testifier. And His presence in our lives is a part of that testimony. Ephesians chapter 1, He's called that the arabon, the down payment. God's way of saying, I have redeemed this person and I will continue my work in him and I will finish my work in this person. Do you see the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life in that way? Do you see the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life if you're a believer in Christ as God's down payment, as God's promise money, I have begun my work and will continue that work in this one who is my child. Even when you experience the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, that should be to you evidence of God's faithfulness to you. Some people struggle mightily with the issue of assurance. And they look at their sins and they go, oh, how, how can I be a believer? And yet, I always ask them, do you believe it's the Spirit of God that has convicted you of these things? Do you believe it's the Spirit of God that convicts you of how much you should love Him? And how you should not love sin, but should love Him? Where do you think that comes from? Do you think the world convicts you of that? And if that is the Spirit of God testifying to you, witnessing to you and bringing conviction to you. That's the role of the Spirit. The Spirit has been given to you for that very thing. And that Spirit then is this down payment, that that pledge money on God's part that He will continue that work. As long as that conviction is there, the one who truly needs to be concerned is the one who has no conviction. The one who truly needs to wonder. Because as we're going to see later on in the book of Hebrews, the Lord chastens those who are His. He disciplines His sons. If you don't have conviction, that's when, that's when there's a problem. But you know what? People who come to me and they're struggling with, with conviction, they're struggling with their sin, it's, they're not the people who are going, eh, yeah, I do that kind of stuff, don't really care. No, there's conviction involved in those things. Likewise, we look at Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, verse 25. And when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. The end of Paul's sermon. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, you will keep on hearing but will not understand, and you will keep on seeing but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull in their ears, they, with their ears they scarcely hear. They have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. Here, the apostle, <laughs> he closes his sermon with a word of warning and judgment. A very harsh word of warning and judgment. And yet, what does he say? The reason these words, you should listen to them, the reason these words are true is because where they came from, the Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers. This took place in history. And just as it was true of their fathers, it was true of them. And this was the Holy Spirit. Now, Isaiah said the words, Isaiah wrote the words, but the Holy Spirit spoke the words. And so very, very clearly we see that from the perspective of the New Testament writers, what they had in the Scriptures that they possessed was spoken by the Holy Spirit of God. It was divine 
And so the writer is not saying something different than it is written, but he is, just as the apostles did in all those references in their preaching and acts, he is giving us an insight into what must be our attitude toward the Word of God as well. And one of the reasons I chose to not just summarize these statements and move on is because I think one of the things that we must do, one of the duties that is that of the elder of the flock, is to look at what's going on out in the fields where the sheep will be encountering the world. And I would say that one of the most constant drumbeats that is pounded into your ears, whether you are aware of it or not, whether it is open and clear or not, one of the most constant drumbeats of unbelief is to question the reality of the existence of divine revelation. One of the ways that this is accomplished is through fraudulent divine revelation. We are surrounded by false scriptures. Now, I doubt many in here have spent much time reading the scriptures of the religions of the world. That's something I have to do. But there are many people who do. And I imagine that if you have engaged in giving testimony, that there have been people who said, well, okay, that's what your Bible says, but why should I believe that? There's all sorts of other books out there that claim to be written by God. I mean, you know, I was out uh, yesterday morning like a... This is the hottest week of the summer. You may have noticed that. So what do I do? I rode 200 miles on a bike. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And yesterday morning I was coming back across Pinnacle Peak. I don't know if any of you live out that direction anymore. We used to have a family that lived right out in that neighborhood. But some of you may have seen the, the, the disputation and the newspaper articles and stuff about the fact that the Mormons are building a temple out there on Pinnacle Peak Road around 55th-ish, 53rd Avenue, somewhere around that area. And as I rode by, I happened to look over and saw the construction of what was going on there. I thought, well, here, here it comes, and started wondering, I wonder if, when they're going to have open house, because I'd like to, I'd like to go through the open house. I've only been through one one Mormon temple. That was in uh, Brooklyn, uh, in no Manhattan, the Manhattan Temple in New York. And I'll go through the open house and uh, get a chance afterwards. They had oh, they just have wonderful refreshments afterwards, <laughs> chocolate chip cookies and water, and uh, it's just it's worth going for. And um, I can see right now that the pastor probably wants to go with me. And um, and. Uh, but uh, uh, the missionaries hover around you and they want to know if you'd like to talk. And guess what? For some strange reason, I want to talk. <laughs> and, and I did uh, in, uh, in Manhattan. And, and they were very surprised that I knew everything that went on in the temple. And that led to some very interesting conversations. And I imagine here in this area, it will lead to my summary being asked to leave. But anyways, I, I, noticed, I, you know, I, I noticed it was there. And many people will tell you, Oh, okay, that's what your Bible says, but what about the Book of Mormon? Ever read that? How about the Doctrine and Covenants? Full Great Price. Ever read that? And of course, in the world today, everyone's talking about the Quran. Ah, the religion of peace. Try to be, try to control yourselves back there. Uh, have you read the Quran? Have you read the Bhagavad Gita? The Upanishads? All these, all these, and, and there's people coming up with new stuff all the time. And these days, with Zulon Press and all the rest of these things, anybody can publish a book. It doesn't matter what it says. There's all sorts of stuff out there. And there's so much of it that especially young people, they go into college, they go into university, and they get exposed to all this stuff, and they take classes on religion. You've got to read a little bit of this there, a little bit of that there. And they're like, I didn't know all this stuff was out there. What makes our Scriptures so special? And hopefully, I think some of the young people in here would testify that 
Some of us, anyways, have tried over the years to prepare them for those things, to give them a foundation upon which to be able to interact with those things, but we have to admit that it's something we've got to deal with. And there are people who've read these things, and well, I, why, why should I believe that? I've read this over here. Have you read that over there? And it can become a barrier to the proclamation of God's truth. Now, I don't believe for a moment that a person reading the Quran is going to experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. Sure, the Quran says some true things. Almost any book says some true things. But the Holy Spirit only testifies to what He Himself has brought into existence, and that is the Word of God. And so we can be confident that the Spirit of God will continue to testify of His truthfulness and of His Word, And we can also be confident of the fact that there is a reason why we have been given the Scriptures. Ever thought about that? When I talk about the canon of Scripture, why we know that Hebrews should be here, but why we don't think that that Clement's epistle to the Corinthians should be in the New Testament. It was written pretty early on. Clement was. It's got a lot of good stuff in it. Of course, it quotes in the New Testament too, but... You know, maybe. When I talk about the canon of Scripture, I like to point out that the God who put out so much effort in the inspiration, the breathing out of the New Testament, I believe that He will put out just as much effort to make sure His people know what is and what is not Scripture. He managed to do it with the Old Testament. There weren't any arguments between Jesus and Ava. Uh, you know, Jesus going, well, don't the Scripture say? And the Jews going, oh, we didn't know that was Scripture. It doesn't happen. I believe that the Scriptures tell us that God has a purpose in giving us His Word. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, Paul says this, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Well, you've got to know what the Scriptures are. That means God had a purpose in our knowing what was and what was not Scripture. And if that same Holy Spirit is active after the writing of the New Testament, who is active after the writing of the Old Testament, then we can have confidence in what God has preserved for us. But we also know what's one of the other big things we've got to deal with is false teachers. I I remember Pastor Fry has absolutely no idea what it's like to be a Southern Baptist and come here. The first couple Sundays were interesting, especially one time Pastor Fry was, pre- was, was praying. Now, I was already involved in apologetics. I, I had already been up to Salt Lake City, I don't know how many times by that time, and written books on Mormonism and all this type of stuff, and, and uh, witnessed of thousands of Mormons by that time, and Joe was witnesses and things like that. But I'll never forget the first time Pastor Fry prayed and he started talking about false teachers and he said, Oh Lord, break their teeth. Now I can guarantee you that has never been said in the Southern Baptist Church. Just No, it's just never happened. Not once. And I remember sitting back going, Hmm, okay. I'm going to have to think through that one, you know. And he's talking about silence them and things like that. And, you know, there's those imprecatory psalms. I didn't know they were imprecatory psalms. You sort of skipped over them in the Southern Baptist Church. But, but they're there. And there are false teachers. And we have all been in situations where we thought we were getting somewhere, we were witnessing to somebody, and all of a sudden they bring up some Benny Hinn type guy. You know, well, I heard so-and-so say, and off to the races you go. And all of a sudden you realize that everything you've been saying has been being misinterpreted by the person you're talking to because they're thinking that you and that guy are on the same page. So we remember Peter's words, speaking of Paul, as also in all his letters, 
speaking of these things, and this is 2 Peter 3.16, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do also the rest of the Scriptures to their own destruction. It's like, wow. Peter recognizes Paul's writings. The Scripture is one of the main reasons liberals don't believe Paul or Peter would ever have said this. Because their views just won't allow for that. That's just that's to be dismissed a priori. But other people go, see, shouldn't quote that Paul guy. Tough stuff in Paul. That's not what Peter said. Peter didn't say don't read Paul's letters. Peter, in fact, just identified Paul's letters as Scripture. But what did he say? In which are some things hard to understand. Yeah, okay which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures to their own destruction. Now what follows if it's the untaught and unstable who distort the Scriptures? What follows by logical necessity is those who are taught and those who are stable can properly handle the Scriptures, not to their own destruction. But it's important to be taught. And it's important to be stable. Well-grounded. Not moved about. I become so concerned. Because we have such ease of access anymore. I talk to people. People pop into our chat channel and stuff all the time from all over the world. Ease of access. And yet sometimes I'm really concerned because they come in and say, Oh, have you seen this? And, uh, for example, there was, uh, I think it was a CNN or Fox or something news story recently about an ongoing textual critical project in the Hebrew Old Testament. It's been going on for years. And the most dangerous thing you can do is get a religion reporter and have them write a story about something like this. Because for those who work in the field, it's like, um, yeah, that's going on all the time everywhere. But a religion reporter comes along, ooh, this is interesting. And, and since they don't know, it, it sounds like someone's just rewriting the entire Old Testament and they're discovering that everything we've ever believed was false. I mean, boy, that is the boilerplate for so many people today. And people will come in and they'll say, did you, did you see this? What, what do you think? And they're all concerned and they're all worried. And, they're, and I just go, stability problems there, huh? You seem to be blown about by every wind. I mean, one little thing, you read, a, you read a news story, and it's like, oh, maybe everything I believe is wrong. Don't sound very taut. Don't sound very stable. Those who are untaught and unstable, they can distort, as they do the rest of the Scriptures, to their own destruction. To their own destruction. Rightly handling the Word of God, my friends, is not just something we happen to really emphasize a lot here. Because if that text is true, if you don't do it, it can result in your own destruction. Because we are handling the very words of God. And if this is the means by which God has given us guidance and direction, well, it's like some folks, I, you know, I do a lot of traveling. And sometimes I have to rent a car. don't really like that. I prefer just getting picked up and taken where I'm supposed to go. But sometimes you've got to rent a car. And if you've, anybody rented a car recently, they offer to, and it costs money, as everything does. Do you want tires? That costs extra. Do you want a <laughs> steering wheel, brakes? That's extra. Yeah, that's great. And now they'll rent you a GPS. Now, over in London, it's a sat-nav, in case you're wondering. Don't bother asking for GPS. They'll look at you in a very British way and wonder what you're talking about. It's a sat-nav over there. But it's, it's GPS here and in Australia. And <laughs> in Peru, they just don't bother with any of that. Just honk and drive. It's just how that works down there. But it's scary to see some of the... Nothing against our senior citizens here. I'm, I'm working on it myself, but especially a little old couple, they'll be standing next to me renting a car. And, Would you like a GPS? And I, I can just tell these folks are going to end up in Nova Scotia and they're going to Florida. I can just tell. 
because, you know, they take it and they're not sure which way to hold it. They don't know where the on-off switch is. And, oh, I'm just like, if you really want to do this to somebody, it can give good guidance. But did you hear the story just last week? Just last week, there was somebody that was seriously injured because they were driving the storm with an outdated GPS device and they drove off a cliff. They drove off a cliff because they hadn't updated their device. So for those of you who have some of the older ones, you need to update the thing. Now, thankfully, we don't need Bible version 2.0. We don't need updates. God got it right the first time around. But the point is, something that can give you good directions. And man, I'll tell you, that I, my, my droid gives me great directions. Takes me right to the front door of a lot of places. Sometimes not so much, but mostly at times it can give good directions. But if you don't use it right, if you don't put in the right information, if you don't handle it right, if you distort what it tells you, it can lead to your own destruction. The Holy Spirit has testified to us. And that means each one of us is accountable for that testimony. Each one of us, the Holy Spirit has testified to us. This is a a public revelation. And we will be held accountable. What is found therein. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22? Have you not read what God spoke to you saying? You see, the fundamental assumption of the writers of Scripture is that when the Holy Spirit speaks, you had better listen. God has given us His revelation. He has testified to us. The writer is telling us about the perfection of the work of Christ. And in the middle, for just a moment, in His words, He reveals to us that the only reason that we would ever have to believe in the perfection of the atonement and eternal life and forgiveness of sins and the deity of Christ. And what's all that based on? It wasn't just something somebody made up one day. It's not some council sat around and said, we're going to teach this, this, and this, and we're going to write this. No. The only reason that these Jewish Christians should press on and not go back to the old way is because God in His Word has spoken with Clarity. He has revealed His truth. He has testified to them and because He is who He is and He does not age and He does not change, His testimony remains just as valid to this very day. That is the glory of the Word of God. That is why the Word of God is the center of our worship and the ministry in this place, and by God's grace, always will be. Let's pray together. Indeed, our Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that from eternity past, You chose to bless Your people through the production of, inspiration of, writing of, and preservation of Your Word. And Your Spirit to this day continues to draw our hearts out to that which He Himself has brought into existence. We believe, we hold to, we love this Word because the Spirit within us has made us new creatures in Christ and it is natural for us to desire to hear Him and to follow Him. And so we would pray for every believer in this room that You would strengthen our faith, that You would Cause us to cling ever more closely to Your Word. And if there be any here who have not bowed that knee in repentance and faith, Lord, that Your Word would come alive in their heart, that You would reveal to them Jesus as the Messiah, the suffering servant, the King of kings, the Lord of all. And Lord, that You would glorify Yourself in their salvation even this day. We pray in Christ's name.